Let's get educated. That's why we're here, to bring you the stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses. It's time for a little education. Why, hello everyone and welcome to a brand new month. How, how, I'm glad we're out of October. We're into yes. November. It's officially, you can have your PSLs now. It's pumpkin spice time. Yep. In case you didn't know, I'm Katie Patrick. That's David Fiorazzo, and he loves pumpkin spice lattes. He has issues, we know. Now, before we get started, though, it may be November, but more importantly, it's tonight. Tonight is our good friend, Dr. Jake Jacobs, release debut of his brand new series entitled A Brief History of American Political Parties. Yes. Let's take a little look at the teaser. Hello America, I'm Dr. Jake Jacobs and I'm excited to tell you about our four-part series entitled A Brief History of American Political Parties. In parts one and two we cover the development and early history of both the Democratic and Republican parties where we love to remind America that after winning one of the most contentious elections in American history in 1800, President Thomas Jefferson declared in his 1801 inaugural address, we are all Republicans, we are are all Federalist. In parts three and four, we covered the good, the bad, and the ugly of both major American political parties from the federal income tax and the New Deal to the Great Society and the Reagan Revolution. Now more than ever, it is imperative that American citizens learn about our great republic under God. So please consider watching our Freedom Project original series, A Brief History of the American Political Parties, and share it with your friends friends and family. God bless this great republic of ours. Katie, I don't think I need that extra shot of espresso in my pumpkin spice latte after watching Jake, so okay, well, I'm good. Good on you then. Well, <laughs> in case you didn't know, if you've been under a rock, uh, we have some midterms next week, so it would be a good time maybe to watch Dr. Jake mm -hmm. explain the mm -hmm. American political parties, get a little education for yourself before voting. Now, the series, again, debuts tonight at 7 p.m. Central, so make sure you do download our Freedom Project app if you haven't done so already, and then you can see all four episodes that he has done. Now, we today on Educated, we're going to start uh, with a prominent Philadelphia K-8 school, and how they're now going to host a drag queen story hour for six-year-olds. So right. say, wait a minute, that doesn't say a library, that says a school, David. A school? And we didn't ask for parent approval? We don't need to do that? No, apparently not? Apparently not. But yeah, you were right, uh, K-8 through public school, Albert Greenfield School, is now hosting drag queen story hour for first grade children. And parents reached out to Libs of TikTok after receiving an email Saturday, the 22nd of October. And it said, your child's classroom will be participating in the Drag Queen Story Hour. Of course, there was no opt-out option mentioned, all right? No discussion with parents, no approval process. And it said, quote, we look forward to an energetic, diverse and inclusive story hour that celebrates every type of family, according to the email. Katie, I don't think it celebrates every type of family. And um, there it is right there. There's the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, what's beautiful about this is how it says that it was created by Philly's queen, Brittany Lynn, with the help of child educators from the city's top museums and schools. So you're getting paid by the school to go spend time developing this. That's good. Uh, but then it continues on uh, that it's, you know, promoting literacy, because that's what Drag Queen Storytime is all about. It's oh. all about promoting the literacy. And if you watched yesterday's <laughs> Educated, yeah. Test scores. You, you should <laughs> go back and watch yesterday's episode again, yep. or watch it for the first time, because we talked about the NAEP scores and how our children cannot read. We can't do math either, but we cannot read. So our literacy, I don't, I guess maybe that's what we need is these uh, drag queen story times to really just infiltrate all the schools. Maybe that's what will make our test scores improve because they're all about literacy, according to them. But it's also um, promoting the literacy by, uh, for all ages, of course, by having some style, some flair and creativity while reading these stories about love and diversity and acceptance. 
Uh, by the way, I just want to do a shout out to Chris Rufo at the City ooh, Journal. Ooh. Phenomenal, Christopher Rufo. And last Friday, I did a podcast on Stand Up for the Truth about this dark, demonic history of the drag queen story hour. And the, the whole agenda, it goes back to the 1950s. That was, I believe, 52 was when the first trans had this, their surgery. Christine Jurgensen, if I remember the name right. But so the timeline goes back to 52. So this new thing where men dressing up as women, sexualized women, is now acceptable in front of children because they're reading a book? Is, how did we get here? So it didn't just happen in the last five, 10 years. It's been in this agenda for many, many decades. So check that out if you can. Or Chris Rufo's article is called The Real Story Behind Drag Queen Story Hour. But back to what's happening in Philly. Again, we wanna stress, we're not talking about a university. We're not talking about a high school. We're talking about six-year-olds. So, Katie, I, I forgive us for being redundant, friends, but this is part of the agenda. You reach children at younger and younger mm -hmm. ages because they, most of them, if not all of them, don't know how to process this whole thing. They're looking at what they think is a funny person in a costume. But part of them maybe understands it's a guy dressed like a woman, but I don't think they do. I think a lot of it's confusing them. And what do you think about that? Well, as a parent of two youngins, I mean, you're told, hey, start feeding the kid vegetables and fruits now because they'll like it and they'll be adjusted to it. And, and you know, if, and if at first they don't like it, you're supposed to keep offering it. <laughs> and maybe eventually then, oh, maybe they'll, they'll hold it in their hand. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll uh, put it on their tongue to just try, oh. And then maybe after continued, continued, continued you, like use, they'll finally take a bite of it and they'll discover, oh, maybe I like this. So you're programming this, your kids you're to like vegetables. You're grooming your child as <laughs> the grooming term. I mean, you, grooming has been that term. Training. Training. Now, I mean, that's you're teaching, you're educating your child about this. This is what is happening with the Drag Queen Story Hour. This is the i think the easiest way the the most palatable we'll bring it back palatable way that the drag queen or the transgender movement has gotten infiltrated into our for the younger and younger grades and when they were able to do the story time at libraries and then you know parents take their kids to the libraries to books oh someone's going to read a book little by little they're starting to be okay with it. Now it's now it's all of a sudden okay. Let's just put it in the schools and see what happens. And here here's the truth of it, mom and dad. If you don't push back on this, if you don't put up a big fight about this, and be like the child who hates their vegetables and throw the vegetables at, <laughs> metaphorically throw the vegetables at the schools, then this is just going to be like, oh okay, see clearly it's okay. The parents think it's okay. It, it's okay for our children too. More and more of this is happening unless we fight back. So they are admitting these words. They're wanting to normalize gender fluidity. And the Greenfield School has confirmed that Drag Story Hour is intended to uh, not only normalize gender fluidity, but produce like diversity. Do you think six-year-olds care about any of this? Anyway, uh, we're not sure what's inclusive about men, generally homosexuals, but not all, dressed as women provocatively, performing for six-year-olds, but welcome to the new normal. Friends, still to come. Now, this next story, whew, get ready. Um, a female high school volleyball player suffered a serious head injury after a, a man, a transgender player, spiked a ball into her face at about 70 miles an hour. Stay with us. If you have a smartphone, tablet, Roku, or Apple TV, consider downloading the Freedom Project media app. It's 100% free and includes all of our weekly shows, plus lecture series, archive programs, and award-winning animated videos for families like the Presidential Minute, Battles of America, and Heroes of the West. Don't rely on the social media giants to keep you informed. Simply download the Freedom Project media app from your app store and allow notifications. And we'll let you know when a new video is ready. All right, so when we talk about high school sports, if you've, you've played any kind of rec league even, if you've played organized sports, there are good teams out there that you just don't look forward to playing against. <laughs> 
right? Because, oh man, that you see them on the schedule, they're good. You're like, oh, this is going to be a tough one. But then there are some teams nowadays that have transgender athletes, and it's pretty much downright ridiculous as to what's happening. And so the volleyball season is pretty much wrapping up uh, around the country, but of course, not before we had a transgender student playing for the Highlands High School team in North Carolina. And uh, he spiked a ball at about 70 miles an hour. Now, they didn't have a clock a gun on him to see what the speed was. Nonetheless, that ball hit the female opponent on the other side at her head. Um, and this, either the student or if it was someone from the school, recruitment, whatever it was, decided to include that clip, which is actually happened back in September, but we just got the clip out now seeing it, in a basically a highlight reel video for the transgender student. Now, the transgender student's reel that includes a bunch of clips, and we're going to show you the specific one, it actually said, uh, you know, five foot nine inches, uh, has a 31 inch vertical, touches 10 feet, has a 3.9 weighted GPA, and is right handed. But it failed to mention that is also a male. Now, we're going to show you the clip here in a moment. Uh, if you don't like to see people get hit in the head with objects that uh, hurt, <laughs> I advise turning away. But otherwise, take a look. Okay. So yeah. we're just showing. There yeah. It is again. Um, yeah. Um, so that. Yes, yeah, she goes right backwards. And it, apparently the young girl, woman, young woman experienced trauma to the head and neck reportedly. And she's still recovering from long-term concussion symptoms, including problems with her vision. Um, she's not been approved yet to compete again. And this happened in September. Now, it's November today, right? This happened in September. And she's still dealing with some serious problems. Katie, when are we going to put a stop to this? Can, can you oh, imagine won't. her parents? They must be infuriated by this. Well, and, and so here's what happened. that The competing team that that girl was on, and we, no one knows her name, although you could probably figure it out, but um, she's from Hiwassi Dam High School. And basically, uh, Hiwassi Dam or Hiwassi Dam, they decided that they were going to forfeit all of their games against the transgender player school, and that decision was actually made by the Cherokee County School Board in a five to one vote. And the board mentioned uh, concerns about safety without addressing the transgender component at all. They were just like, oh, for the safety of our girls on the volleyball team, we're just going to say, you know, we're going to forfeit it. Um, so they didn't talk about the fact that they had a biological male with a significant physical advantage uh, overpowering that female player. And again, you can see that five, nine, boom, look wow. at, wow, look at that. We're showing it again for any of you listening on the podcast because yeah. that it's just, uh, literally he's up at the the front of the net, just just towering over the net. Now, it's really kind of hard to aim precisely where you hit the ball. I'm sure he didn't try to hit her in the face, but you spike the ball at or near an opponent so they can't get to it and re react and hit it back over. But still, you said it right, the significant physical advantage that biological males have over biological females from running to weights to wrestling to volleyball, which, which what we've just seen. And uh, this is something that it's not getting enough debate it seems, across the country. At least I'm not hearing enough of it. Well, and as we've seen in pretty much all the other instances of this happening, whether it's collegiately let's talk about Leah Thomas and the swimming again, yep. or down here at the high school level is these girls are silenced. Like the girls are told, you can't, you're not allowed to say anything hmm. because if Billy decides to be, you know, uh, Bertha now, th Bertha has to, it has to be accepted. Here's what I'll say though. I uh, worked at more information about me during grad school. <laughs> I worked at the student newspaper and I got to cover the sports. And uh, for one of my, I did a video thing where I covered the volleyball team and D one, you know, this is college D1 volleyball. Division I, one. Yep, for division those of one. You. So they're they're very good. And I had an All American who uh, I had her spike the ball at me, and it hurt. <laughs> and I got just hit in the forearms. Like I was able to, you know, bump it off. But that as a D1 level girl, 
not a high school girl who's supposed to be playing against other high school girls. Mm -hmm. So when you get to, it could, because this argument was brought up about like, how, why would you forfeit this, the school that decided to forfeit? Why would you forfeit? You know, uh, this isn't the fastest I've ever seen, the hardest hit ball. But when you have girls competing at various levels, like high school, they're different levels, and then you throw a, a, a boy, a high school boy into the mix, it's not even playing field whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Well, our, our culture is evidently confused about this whole thing, and, and we've just got to keep speaking the truth about it. Now, coming up, finally, a good story to discuss. As a Washington High School football coach, this is unbelievable, a victory for religious freedom. After being fired seven years ago for praying on the football field voluntarily, and his students joined him, we're, we're talking about that next, where he got his job back. Do you love America? Are you a patriot who desires to preserve the freedoms we enjoy for generations to come? Then let's take action. Every few days, we give our money to the big box stores. How we spend our dollars could be the most important vote. Do these stores promote freedom and American values? Is that where we should be buying our everyday household products for the rest of our lives? What if we just stop? What if we shopped with a family-owned manufacturer who believes in preserving our freedoms? That's why SwitchToAmerica.com was created. SwitchToAmerica.com gives patriots the ability to walk away from the big box stores forever. This is a movement that pledges allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. SwitchToAmerica.com. Take action if you love this country. Here is a great way to show it. SwitchToAmerica.com. Okay, off the court, onto the field, and this time, positive news. Uh, we have a high school football coach from Bremerton High School in Washington State. He was fired all the way back in 2015 because, you know, he recited prayers at midfield by himself, but then students voluntarily mm -hmm. joined him in uh, praying after football games. Okay, so after, after the game's over, he'd go to midfield, and then eventually students started to come along with him and, and pray. Wow. A district court said that, uh, yeah, hey, that's okay. Because back in 2015, they said, oh, no, 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 that's not okay. So he had gotten fired, but now he must be reinstated by March of 2023. His name is Joe Kennedy, the good one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the good Joe Kennedy. If, yeah. You know, <laughs> Joe Kennedy is out there. Yeah. Uh, he, so he began reciting post game prayer by himself. Eventually, the students started to join him, and according to court documents, it evolved into motivational speeches and included religious themes. And so after an opposing coach, I'm guessing he was bitter that they must have lost or something, an huh. opposing coach brought it to the principal's attention, then the school district told Kennedy that he had to stop doing the prayers and such. And he did temporarily, but then he notified the school that he's going to resume the practice of it. Because guess what? I bet he, he found quite good value in it. And I bet the students found value in it as well, David. Yeah, they did. Um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you don't hear a lot of great court cases coming out when, where this is concerned. But this is a huge First Amendment issue, friends. And it was good to see this one. Think about the guy. He lost his job. He loved leading and coaching his students on the football field. And he was a veteran. So he, he thought like, hey, I fought to preserve freedoms in America. And I come home, I'm coaching, and we're on a football field, and I can't even go out and take a knee for a minute. This is amazing. So I think we have a video on part of his interview. You know, and Joe, can you believe that this is what they're worried about? We have so many other things that our country is facing that are scary and wrong, and they're worried about you innocently praying for those students because you care so much about them. Yeah, just giving a, you know, uh, five seconds, ten seconds of a prayer of thanks. Yeah, I, I guess it's not good to be thankful these days, but I, I'm going to keep doing it. That's right. And again, he must be reinstated by March of 2023, which is nice. Now, of course, the reason this thing originally blew up is because it, it got media attention because someone had to go to the media. And of course, how, did the, how does the media spin everything? And so what happened was... He, when he originally said he's going to go back to, to praying on the field, they say it raised security concerns. So basically, because what happened is a bunch of people, they say stormed the field in support of him, though. So they were, they were trying to be like, oh, we can't have all these religious people out oh, here geez. on a field to 
say, as he even said, you know, say thanks. Be grateful for what we are able to do here in this nation, or once were. I Katie, guess I thought the left was going to be tolerant. Uh, th that's one of their primary values, wasn't it? Tolerance, and they can't allow a man, a, a coach, to go out on a public, you know, football field and pray silently. He's not trying to start a religion, establish a religion. He's not trying to, to do anything to force people to believe what he believes. But to have that right taken away, and the, even the chance, even that it was seven years, I still have a hard time with that. But um, anyway, it's it's a good thing. That's what we wanted to bring this to you today. It's a very good decision and a very important case because that we're talking about public places here and you know, religious freedom. All right. Well, before we go, is up next, and we're going to enjoy a video from a Twitter employee showing the world just what it's like to, I uh, guess, what they're calling work at a social media company. Get ready for gourmet meals a little foosball, maybe some red wine on tap. Stay right here. We want to hear from you. If you have a question or comment for Katie, David, or any of our other show hosts, simply visit stayeducated.org. That's stayeducated.org and submit your question or comment. Our team loves to hear from you and might just give you a shout out on air. Again, visit stayeducated.org and connect with us. All right, before we go, Katie, have you ever flown first class? One time I did because I got bumped because oh. I was tra traveling by myself. I guess that must be the way to do it. But I got to fly all, all the way over to England in first class. Oh, my goodness. Did it was you bougie. Pick, yeah, did you pick the right? It's not like going from uh, Detroit to Chicago. Yeah, no, that would not be a good class, one to fly first class. I remember getting upgraded myself. But anyway, um, American Airlines says it's dumping it's first class seating because passengers simply aren't seeing the difference anymore. According to the airline, the quality of the business class seat has improved so much, and frankly, by removing it, we could provide more business class seats, which is what our customers most want or are most willing to pay for, end quote. The company says despite ticket sales being down, 9.6%. They still managed to hit a record quarterly revenue of $13.5 billion. So, more expensive seats. And shocker, since removing the mask mandate on planes, more people are now booking flights. <gasps> Gasp! Uh, Katie, first class or not, it's all about the almighty dollar, isn't it? When it oh, comes it down to it. Just not one dollar, though. Billions of them. Billions. Billions of them. Yes. Billions of dollars. Uh, speaking of flying high in the wake of Elon Musk officially taking ownership of Twitter, one employee thought it would be fun to give us all a brief glimpse into the life of a Twitter employee. So let's take a look at the rough and tough, stressed out world of working at a social media company in San Francisco. Welcome to a day in my life as a Twitter employee. So this past week went to SF for the first time at a Twitter office, badged in, honestly took a moment to just soak everything in. What a blessing. Also started my morning off with an iced matcha from the perch. Then I had a meeting, so quickly scheduled one of these little pod rooms, which were so cool. They're literally noise canceling. Took my meeting, got ready for bunch. Look how delicious this food looks. Oh my goodness, I was so overwhelmed. Then made my way down to this log cabin area. I don't know what this is, but it was really cool. Played some foosball with my friends to kind of unwind a bit. Um, also found this really cool meditation room that I thought was super neat. Um, I didn't do any yoga, but they have this yoga room if you are a yogi, so also thought that was really cool. Um, had a couple more meetings in the afternoon, had a ton of projects that we needed to knock out. Say hey to my teammates. Um, <laughs> went, to the, went to the library to kind of get some more work done. Obviously had to have our afternoon coffee, so made some espresso. And then before leaving for the day, had some red wine um, that's on tap went up to the rooftop and just honestly enjoyed the beautiful weather so awesome trip on the rooftop as well and that food that's worth just anyway 
That's, I quit. You know, it's hard. I for, demand huh. we huh. get an espresso machine that looks like that. I demand that we get a yoga room so we can do some yoga or meditation. Well, at least lunch on Mondays. Come on, Mr. Hi. Menzel. Hey. Uh, no, no, well, ser- seriously, this is, um, it's hard not to covet that and go, wow, I want a job like that. But anyway, you probably wouldn't because you'd be bored. But look at the frou-frou lifestyle. This is the thing that people are, are so out of touch with reality when it comes to this. But um, anyway, finally, Disney Plus. Ugh, Disney. They're looking, for, they're looking to push yet another agenda by featuring a young, obese girl in a new animated short. Now, the school film entitled Reflect showcases on an aspiring ballerina named Bianca who is torn between her desire to dance and her frustration that she does not possess the body type that traditional ballerinas often have. While one, or while some say this kind of heroine is a step in the right direction from Disney's typical super slim princesses, others say it encourages kids to be unhealthy. Katie, as a person who promotes healthy lifestyles and has a show called Healthy Republic, mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? That's, that's true, I do. Um, I would have to see the film to see what jokes they're making. Mm. That's very telling. If it's Good call. she's you know, eating healthy or if they're just trying to really ramp it up to make a point of this fat positive positivity, I think that's body positivity. Pa- body positivity, fat positive whatever it is. <laughs> if they are pushing that, then absolutely this is the most potentially detrimental film that they Disney has put out mm. as of late, I guess. Mm. Uh, but if they're going to have a movie about her becoming a ballerina, then I would like to have a movie for myself about me being the center of a basketball team. Can that happen, please? Please? Hmm? Good point. Yeah. That wraps it up for this segment, friends. More to come next time. Oi. Well, anyway, make sure you do smash that like button if you're watching us on social media. And, hey, give us a, a little feedback. Some questions. We'll give you some answers uh, by visiting stayeducated.org. And, again, Tonight's the night. Yes. So remember to check out the premiere of Dr. Jake's new series, A Brief History of American Political Parties, at 7 p.m. Central. Now for David, for myself, thank you for watching, listening, and supporting the show. And until next time, stay educated.